Who is Paloma Faith? A girl from Hackney that stumbled upon a singing career. Double platinum and Brit award winning artist Paloma Faith. She's had numerous top 10 albums. Uh, known for unapologetic approach to both life and music. Is the key to a successful relationship that women have to compromise their expectations? You know, on social media, it's Perfection is plastered in front of us every day. The perfect kids, the spotlessly clean house. If I'm really honest right now, I feel quite sad about the world. Shit's about to get very real. Hi, I'm Abby Clancy and welcome to Exhibit A. Today's guest is a global superstar, a fashion icon, an author and a mum of two. She's honest, unapologetic and unafraid when it comes to challenging societal norms. Shit's about to get very real. Please welcome Paloma Faith. Thank you, Paloma, for coming on. Thanks of for course, having me. I know who you are, but for those who don't, who is Paloma Faith? A girl from Hackney that stumbled upon a singing career and an acting career, and now I've written a book, which has been Sunday Times bestseller for nine weeks. That is incredible. I can't believe it, and it's called MILF. Um, so I, I guess I'm a slashy. A slashy? Lots so, of things. Pop star, fashion icon, mummy, author. Yeah. Singer. Bits and bobs. Bits and bobs. Hustler. Hustler. That's sort of the umbrella term. Um, <laughs> in your book, you refer to the fact, in your words, we as women find ourselves in a culture which has sold us an unrealistic dream. What does it mean to be a woman today to you? The expectations are really high and also too conflicting. Mm. And I feel like a lot of what my book's about is the fact that I was raised by a feminist. So I was brought up to be empowered and like a lot of kind of um, beauty standards rejected. And then they've kind of come full circle. And now in the sort of wake of early, the the initial kind of um, early start of feminism, I feel like as women, we're expected to do all of it. Yeah. And it's kind of rebranded to us as empowerment, but I don't necessarily find it empowering. I find it... Exhausting. Exhausting and a bit impossible. And, um, yeah, and I just, yeah, I feel like it's too much. The kind of, like, looks versus lack of sleep versus Mm. um, mothering versus career, like, versus you know, cooking and all of that constantly for your kids and then remaining slim yourself and not eating their leftovers. Impossible. Um, (laughs) That was me last night. Like, I was doing, like, spaghetti meatballs for everyone and then he's like, are you not eating? I'm like, no, because I've had four kids leftovers. (laughs) I had about 12 meatballs just to be sad. Yeah, but, like, um, all of it's just, it doesn't correlate, it doesn't work and it's all in conflict with the rest. Yeah. I agree with that. Also, I just think, like, I'm raising two daughters and I try to, like, actively say to them things like, oh, that's so clever of you, or wow, you're so strong, and stuff like that, rather than, like, look at you, beautiful girl. You know, like, because I don't want them to grow up thinking that that's their currency. Yeah. Although they are. I mean, don't tell them I said. (laughs) But, like... (laughs) Yeah. But I just, I would like them to feel more confident about being intelligent or strong or like brave or confident. empathetic. Yeah. yeah. Confident, all those things. So what was life like for you growing up? I used to tell people my childhood was like perfect. I remember telling someone when I was about 14 that my childhood was perfect and amazing and my mum shouting from in the kitchen, no, it bloody wasn't. <laughs> She's lying. She's an optimist. <laughs> She's an optimist. Hey, that's a good thing to be. Um, But growing up, I think I was lucky that I had creative parents, so I was cultivated to be that way. I didn't, like, ever feel under any pressure to sort of be normal. I thought that my... The way I am, I thought was normal until I went into mainstream culture and then people were always calling me quirky or unusual or whatever because I didn't know anything else. Yeah. And then when it happened, I was like, am I? Mm. thought this was normal because I was always surrounded by creative-minded people. My mum's really into psychology, but I was brought up in, like, you know, a very, like, left-wing socialist working-class household. My mum was a single parent. Um, my dad, I saw at weekends, slightly problematic character, um, to be polite. 
um, and yeah, I, I grew up in like Hackney, diverse cultures. I feel like culture is an interesting thing to me because I've had so many my whole life that um, being like not in a melting pot is uncomfortable mm. to me. Like mm. being amongst one singular culture and not in the melting pot feels awkward to me. Yeah. And that's like a big part of my identity. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of being like a Hackney Londoner and like, it's very much sort of defined me, I think. You said you're, you've said you're so fiercely driven and independent. Yeah. How was this extreme independence installed in you as a child, do you think? Well, I think growing up as like um, my mum's only child, I've got two siblings from my dad's next relationship, but I was brought up in a house where my mum was a single parent and I was on my own a lot. So I had to make my own fun, I guess, yeah. like stimulate myself. Um, get on with stuff. Was it a lonely was childhood? Well, I've never felt lonely because I'm always busy and I've always been a busy-minded person. Yeah. Like, I don't believe... I was I was brought up to believe that there was no such thing as bored, only boring people. And it was my responsibility. I, f I felt that, to not be bored. Yeah. Um, or be boring. So I try not to be either. And, um, yeah, I don't think it was lonely. I think the hyper responsibilities also because coming from like a, you know, divorce household, I think that and being the only child, I think I took on the responsibility for my mum's feeling. She didn't give it to me, but I just felt yeah. responsible for her naturally because it was just me and her. And if she was sad, I was always like feeling like, what can I do to make it better? What, how can I help her? Just by nature as a kid. And I think that I've carried that on to adulthood. Like, mm. I'm always feeling I'm hyper-responsible. Yeah, take on everyone's Yeah, and if emotions. something goes wrong, it's always my fault. Like, yeah. and, and I'm actually sort of, at the moment, trying to work on that a bit. Like, you know... That, that's a hard burden to carry. I, I, I feel similar to you in that, in that sense. Yeah. You know... I kind of envy those people who can look at a problem in a situation and go, yeah, I feel empathetic towards that, but I am not going to absorb any of it. Yeah, I, or that's I, their stuff. Yeah, you know, I, when people I take, go, that's your stuff, and you're like, oh my God, like, how yeah. did you do that? So I started trying to learn that. Because it's true sometimes. It's like not necessarily just you that's yeah. contributing to a situation. It's like everyone comes with their own baggage. Definitely. And how was your relationship with your mum? It was brilliant. And intense and very codependent. And I feel like growing up and then having my own kids and separating from it was a difficult, quite tumultuous separation because we were so intense. It was difficult for both of us. Yeah. And it was weird because a lot of people talk about how you get closer to your parents when you had kids. And I feel like when I had kids, me and my mum, I speak about it in the bit in the book, mm. we struggled a bit because it was like our dynamic was shifted because then I, my focus was on my kids. And I think that it's we're, we're really like doing well to come back round now, but it's hel it feels healthier, feels yeah. less codependent. I spent most of my childhood just devastated by the prospect my mum might die because my mum was ill from the day I was born. Like when I was born, she already had a brain tumour and then she's had cancer and she's had various other issues my whole childhood. And I always felt my mum would die and I felt so preoccupied with it to the point where even the school called my mum once and was like, we think she's got an unhealthy attitude towards you dying. Because if she was yeah. five minutes late, I'd be like, she's going to die. And but I if, think you were, just... if you were, if it was just you and your mum growing up. Yeah. You know. Like I, I really suffer with health anxiety, but with towards my kids, yeah, and it's on that like ruins my life. No, I, yeah, that's kind of like um, fantasy, but negative <laughs> yeah. fantasizing. Yeah, like catastrophizing. Yeah, and you've gone right to the end get day of it, and you're just imagining it. it's awful. It's really bad. Yeah, it's horrible. Self destructive. Um, yeah, it is. Um, but your mom, your mom brought you up to be resilient. Yeah. Um, she taught you about clothes and makeup to use as your coat of armour. So do you think your mum was preparing you for maybe one day being out on your own or just setting you up for the future? 
She was always amazing at trying to prepare me for situations. And I try to do that with my child. Like we just recently had someone that's been in our lives a long time working with me leave. And my daughter was doing, I could see in her what I was like as a kid. But she just was like, I don't understand why she'd leave us because we. I feel like she loves us. Yeah. And that doesn't make sense. And then I just said to her, and I was really like pleased that I said it, but I said, in life, sometimes things happen that you can't explain and you must not think it's because of anything you did because you didn't. Yeah. And that goes back to what I was saying before. I always think everything's my fault. Yeah. But I'm just trying to like raise her as my mum did to, in preparation for life that sometimes shit's going to happen. And we can't just sit there thinking it's our fault. Yeah. And I could see her face and the way she was processing it, thinking what could have I done differently to stop that person leaving? And the reality is is nothing because mm. they were going to leave anyway for whatever their reasons are. They've got their own stuff going on. But I feel like my mum was really good with me on that. And because of the intensity of that kind of dynamic of one child and one mum, yeah. we talked a lot and I was raised to be... I guess, really emotionally intelligent from a super young age. Like I've been quite analytical mm. and the way I speak, like every relationship I've ever been in, it's the most striking thing that people I've been in relationships with are like, wow, you, you really dissect everything. <laughs> and sometimes that can be annoying for people, but it's because that's how I was raised. My mum and I just dissected everything. Like mm. something would go wrong, let's break it down, yeah. let's discuss why we responded that way, blah, blah, blah. And it's like... That that's in me mm. and I was raised that way. Do you think how we were raised by our own parents affects how we are as parents? It definitely does. But sometimes the way you were raised, it directly affects the way you want to do the exact opposite with your own kids. You know, sometimes counter what our parents did, then we'd be raised with perpetual trauma and generation after generation would just suffer. So we yeah. have to make changes. You say in the book you survived rejection from your father yeah do you, did you feel you had a father figure growing up at all or not I've got so many father figures because I've sort of I joke about it I've collected men around in my life older <laughs> men that I've had loads and I had my stepdad first was um sort of with my mum since I was about four or five and he's still in my life he lives near me he like does amazing things like sometimes I'll just be at home and I'll see on the ring doorbell that he's just watered my front garden without ringing oh. the bell he's just like gone to quickly do that's it that's lovely though. you know like things but with, with that thankless task yeah. kind of thing so I feel like I've got um male figures that really look out for me like weirdly my accountant's one of them like yeah. he's really caring I've known him since the beginning of my career and he's always looked out for me um and there's loads of people around me like work and everything like a lot of older male figures that I feel yeah You've really care on. yeah so your mother and journey started before you had your own kids you know you yeah. were looking after your mother you became your sister's legal guardian do you think that has shaped how you are as a parent now definitely I feel like I was always hyper responsible and being a mum is that it's like being responsible for everything and everyone um and I think I've always been a maternal person mm. like I've always taken people in I've had friends that have been homeless for a while that have lived with me I had an actual a homeless person live in my house for over a year before like I like helping people out. I think when I became a mother, I had to put a little bit of the stoppers on that because I was before I was just like everyone, which is why in the book I also argue that being a mother isn't necessarily meaning that you've had children. I know quite a lot of, of course. motherly women that have, have not had kids mm -hmm. or chosen not to have kids, but they're the mothers, they're the matriarchs. And I think that I was definitely that person before I had my own kids. And I've had to sort of stop um, kind of outsourcing all of my maternal instinct to people more than I did before because I owe it to my kids not to just like spread myself Stretch that thin. thin. Yeah. yeah. You talk in the book about having it all and you think society's per perception is outdated mm. and as women, we can't have it all. 
which I, I agree with. I think, yeah. I know in my life, and I've got an, an incredible husband who's very supportive, but he walks out the door, goes to work and doesn't think, who's picking the kids up from school? Yeah. Who's making the dinner? Is the food in? You know, who's got to do the homework? Who's going to bath them, put, put them to bed? And it's like, it's exhausting all these little daily, mundane, small stresses. I don't know why they don't think of that, though. I don't. <laughs> because they see it every single day and you're working as well mm. as him. And, like, I'm not criticising it. It's it's societal. It's like a societal yeah. issue. But I don't understand why if you see someone do something every single day, you don't just go, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Because we all, we do it and we are sort of raised almost as women to feel that's our responsibility and we do it without question. Mm. And I don't understand why they don't go, I don't, that doesn't sit right with me. Yeah. I, I want to take over these elements. It's, how do you think we can change that? I think it's down to them. Because... Mm. Because we can say, like, oh, I'd like you to do this. But that's still another job. Delegating's a job in itself, isn't it? Oh, my it? God, yeah. It yeah. becomes like you're the boss and then you then you resent the that role. The yeah, nag. you're always on at me. For the, yeah. You know, you don't want that either. Mm. But I grew up with, like, my dad. My dad's an incredible dad, but he was very old-fashioned. He, was, he would, like, take the boys to sport or to football and... It was like, no, as a woman, you stay at home, you cook and clean and go and get your hair done or shop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, I don't mind the hair in the shop. And, but it's like, there's, <laughs> there's you know, it, there's a, a very clear divide in the in the roles, I think. Yeah, me too. And it's unspoken. No, it is. And then also sometimes what you run into as well is you say to that out loud and then men would go, well, if I did the supermarket shopping, I'd you'd get always say I get it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Which they do. Let's be but honest. they do, but it's like, why don't you know what we need? Because we eat the same thing every week. Yeah, Kids exactly. don't like much change. Yeah. They always want bloody breaded chicken fillets or whatever it <laughs> yeah. is you do. Chicken on couchons. A, on the, like, rotation. No, it's so true. <laughs> um, motherhood were painted this unrealistic ideal, mm. which creates a lot of pressure. Every time I have this conversation with my mum, who's like the generation before, she always says, but it's a joy, but it's a pleasure, but it's a, you know, there's no, you keep using the word sacrifice, you know, and I'm like, there is sacrifices. Let's not like, it doesn't mean that you're not grateful willing, or you're not grateful, but it's like, she goes, I don't like the word sacrifice. I think it's, it sound, sounds like you're resentful and bitter. It's like, no, I'm not resentful and bitter. I love my kids. Like, I yeah. live for my kids. They're my number one. But it's like there is no sugarcoating it. Like, for, for many generations, women have done it silently. And I think it's quite important that now we're vocalising and saying, you know, I give these things up. Mm. I was just going through my phone now to look for some pictures for something. And I saw pictures of me, like, maybe like eight months postpartum and I look older in those pictures than I do now because <laughs> yeah. I was just so tired yeah. I'm ancient I know now Isn't it I'm funny like, how you forget those days going to have a facial and stuff <laughs> yeah. but then or a face like, lift oh. yeah. <laughs> like, that's what I need <laughs> <laughs> but it's like yeah it's just um it's funny though like because my daughter's 13 and oh she's gonna be a nightmare to her husband she is not gonna take Anything. Any shit. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm creating a monster here or what, you know. <laughs> but I think good. Yeah. And and what I worry about for my kids as well is like, me and my mum talk about it a lot because my mum was divorced and I obviously broke up with my kid's dad. We say, is the key, and I'll ask you this because you're in a successful relationship, is the key to a successful relationship from the outside eye, I mean, that women have to compromise their expectations and that the women who won't are the ones who will be alone and or or like me jumping from one relationship to the other because I'm not great at comp I'm probably like what your daughter's going to be like <laughs> yeah. and and I look at my friends who are in long term relationships and I think there's no difference between my feelings and theirs yeah. like when we have deep conversations quietly behind everyone's back 
it's unanimous. Mm-hmm. The, the the kind of dissatisfaction, the the feeling that we're not acknowledged for what we do, all of that, it's mutual. It's just that one party is staying and going, yeah, I'll stick I'll with it. it. And the other one, like I, me, is going, ah, just break <laughs> down the, the, the I, building. I, I think... And, I think compromise is easier if you're happy in your relationship. So if the person makes you feel like oh, oh, on a, a daily fulfilled, basis loved, adored, yeah. then you're like, "Oh, I kind of forgive you for those things." But if you've potentially come home every day and feel ignored yeah. and not very attractive and blah blah blah, then maybe you'll just be like, "I'm done with that." Yeah, but like don't get me <laughs> wrong, I I there's always an argument going on in our house. I'm like, yeah. this no, same thing, these mundane jobs, like this morning, for example, 7.30, Pete leaves. I'm like, Pete, I'm leaving at eight. Who's going to take the kids to school? I'm like, He's like, well, I'm going to work. You'll have to take them. I'm like, well, no. I'm going to I'm work. I'm going to work. So it's these little things, but Pete is very good. We have a, such a strong relationship, thank God. Like and a friendship, you Friendship, mean. and yeah. he makes me laugh, and I do feel supported, but... I feel like I definitely sacrifice more than he does. But because he's so kind, he kind of gets away with it. (laughs) No, I get it. It makes sense to me. Okay, so let's talk about your book, MILF. It stands for Motherhood, Identity, Love and Fuckery. Why did you feel it necessary to reclaim this term and what does the word mean to you? Um, It's funny because people kept calling me that, like, (laughs) as a joke. Do you take offence to that or do you quite like it? I write about it in the book. Like, I can see all angles. When someone just says to me, like, you're you're a bit of a MILF, I like it. Yeah, stiffless mom. when you break it down, like I do in the book, it's quite offensive. (laughs) But I wouldn't, like, I'm not one of those people who just pounces on, you know, if someone's trying to give me a compliment in their eyes, I'm not going to be like, you bastard. But um, I can see both sides. Like, yes, it's offensive because it implies... Um, the you know women are only good for like how they look and to yeah someone to have sex with them to be a mum yeah <laughs> or pro, or to or to reproduce mm. so that's our two whereas I think we're a bit more um, you know multi layered than that <laughs> yeah I, I agree <laughs> the, the book is so brutally honest it's refreshing and relatable. Um, who did you write this book for? Because, you know, I, I personally feel every woman reading this book would be like, I get it. I feel that. Mm. I wrote it because I felt that when I became a mother, all of the books were about being great for the child. Mm. And there wasn't any books to understand how to be all right for myself. Yeah. And so I wrote it to say to mums, like, you know, it's okay if you don't, have all the textbook responses to pregnancy, to looking at your child for the first time, to your fertility, to, you know, to have miscarriages, to have, you know, postpartum depression, like all of these are not failures. And um, I I wanted to sort of, I guess, write something that was, I keep saying to people, it's a hug for mothers or for women, actually, and also non-childbearing mothers. But when I say mothers, I've do the umbrella term women it's a hug for them and also um it's a bit of a wake-up call for men Mm. and it's funny because since the book came out when it first came out it was a lot of women coming up to me in the street tearful and emotional about the fact they felt acknowledged and they don't feel alone yeah and then it's a bit of time passed and then men came up to me and they were tearful I had one guy come up to me absolutely in floods of tears and hugged me and say that I'd saved his marriage mm. because he didn't understand what his wife was going through and their relationship was on the rocks for the first year which is quite standard for people to like have a rocky relationship in the first year yeah and he was just hugging me like saying you I, I read it and then I understood she told me read that and then tell me if you want to break up yeah and she's like and then he said like our relationship's intact and we got out the other side and I'm just grateful. You say in your book that you try to be present, but often you don't feel present in anything. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, I want to be really attentive, fun and creative, dynamic mother to mm. my kids. And then I want to be the best singer, songwriter, actress, whatever I'm doing 
alert, entertaining person as as like a sort of a public facing figure, I guess. And sometimes because of the pull, I feel like I'm kind of like, sometimes I'll be on stage thinking about, you know, whether I ordered enough school uniforms. I know. And sometimes I'll be with the kids like, Get me out of here. And realise, <laughs> or, or realising that they've been, the, the seven-year-olds told me half a story and going, what do you think I should have done? And I'm like... I didn't hear it. I didn't listen. Yeah. And you, this is obviously important to you. And I have to say, I'm really sorry. I just wasn't engaged. Can you start again? And she's like, oh. I know. I, th- I think that's normal. I yeah. think, I think, and, you know, you talk a lot about guilt as well, which is something I suffer with because I feel like, you know, when you have kids, you're kind of automatically expected to drop who you are as a person, your identity, and you're just looking after this thing. But sometimes, you, as you say, you want to be everything, you want to do everything, and it's like striving for that, you know, perfection. And Because I, I feel terrible when I'm like at home with the kids and they're all driving me mad. I'm like, I would love to go to work now and speak yeah. to adults you feel like, also you feel a bit like you're ungrateful for yeah. having those kids. But it's literally temporary, but you've sort of condemned yourself to a life in hell because, <laughs> yeah. or a death in hell or whatever, because you're like, I've done, I've failed today because whatever, like they they keep you up all night and then expect you to be an amazing mum that day. Like yeah. both of mine wake up, I don't know about yours, but mine wake me up, like it's like they're in a conspiracy like one of them's every night. Yeah. They're just like, oh, was it whose turn is it tonight to screw up her sleep? Ours is um, musical <laughs> beds. I don't know who I'm going to wake up with in my house. I'm like, I go to bed with Peter and I wake up with someone completely Several different. Children. <laughs> one, at least two of the four are in my bed. Every And the cat. Cat's like sitting on my head and then the kids. And I'm just getting kicked <laughs> in the face. But, uh, but you, then everyone, like, when you say anything like that, you're like, oh, and then... I've sometimes said something like that on like social media and then someone's underneath going, don't waste these years, I know. you'll never get them back. You know, on social media, we're all, we're all you know, th- this perfection is plastered in front of us every day. The perfect kids, the spotlessly clean house, the banana bread. And then you're, yeah. and then you're like, oh my God, should I be doing that? Yet we can't silently parent anymore. Yeah, I, I actually, when I first had my child the first child I'm not going to say who but there's somebody on social media that I knew that presented this perfect parent thing and I slipped into their dms at one of my <laughs> lowest moments and was like fuck off no I didn't swear <laughs> them I was just like is it as perfect as it looks because if it is I'm failing mm. like can you help me and then she responded no of course it's not like mm. this is what I'm presenting because you know, it's a source of income for yeah. people. Like, you know, people are paid to be perfect. And, yeah. you know, there's a reason why I don't have many brand deals. It's because I tell the truth. <laughs> I um... And it's like people don't want to set... They don't want a brand alignment with somebody who's just, like, saying, yeah, it's half assed It's all... Like, they want this perfection and they want people to feel that they're, when they buy their product that they get it's it. It's achievable. But it's like you know, this is this person's livelihood and they market their parenting that way and sometimes people do that for those reasons. But that's why I wrote this book and that's why I, you know, uh, forfeited <laughs> all the brand deals that would obviously be queuing up. <laughs> no, but, like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I just think in the interest of people's sanity, it's really important that I just sit here and say, no, none of us are perfect. Our parents weren't perfect. Yeah. And I don't I, think I, I it's don't good remember for our my, kids. I don't remember my mum and dad sitting doing my homework with me every day and no. doing all of these things that, as you say, if you yeah, don't do, do, I'd do my failing. homework and then I might take it to her and say, I've struggled with this. Can you tell me how to do that one? Or I didn't whatever. even do mine. Didn't you? I just I copied did. off Kaylee's and I got to just go, <laughs> <laughs> give, us, give us your maths, let me copy it. But it's true. It's like it's um it's too much on you know on it's us. Too much pressure, and it's not real. It's it's not. Everyone's struggling, and we all have good days and bad days. I don't think it's that good for our kids either to mm. believe that there's such thing as a perfect parent. I think some of my greatest breakthroughs as a parent have been when I've admitted to my 
children that I made a mistake or yeah. said sorry to them. I'm really sorry I snapped. Yeah. But I'm really tired today because I'm overwhelmed with work and that's not your problem. But I'm snappy. So I'm going to ask you if today you could just do everything that I asked with ease and not <laughs> yeah. fight me just till the end of the day and tomorrow we'll go back to normal but mm. I just need this. Or don't wake me up tonight because I just need to sleep. Yeah. And quite often they do. They mm. do it. They listen. Mm. And they're like, are you better this morning? Mm. And usually the answer is yes. Yeah. Sleep. Yeah. Sleep helps everything. Um. But that goes back to that inner bully, doesn't it? And us being so hard on ourselves. And, you know, your therapist said, would you speak to your child how you speak to yourself? You know, we yeah. we can't be perfect all the time. And that is okay. It's okay to have a shitty day. So we need to be kinder to ourselves, I would say. Um, okay, so let's talk. I also, just to add to that, the other thing is we always think we've got to occupy our kids every fu every second that they're alive and awake. That with some that. activity, I know. some art thing, potato prints, whatever, make a cake, blah, blah. And it's like when I was little as an only child and my mum was working full time, I just made my own games up. Mm. Why do I feel that I've got to do an activity every five seconds and be this yeah. dynamic sort of children's TV presenter character? All day, we're going to do this. I mean, that is great sometimes and mm. I think it's important. And I also think that not necessarily sticking in front of the TV, which we all do, let's yeah. not lie, is always great. Like sometimes it's like they go, can I watch telly? And I say no. And they go, well, play with me. And I say no. no. <laughs> like there's boxes of stuff there. Go and get some paint, do your thing, you know, read mm. a bit, practice your reading, whatever. It's like occupy yourself. Not with those two things. I think that's definitely a new thing because I do the exact same thing. I'm like every single weekend. Looking online quickly, didn't what, Instagram, working, like, quick I, was, I was doing it last night in bed. Like I'm going strawberry picking on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids are like, oh, mom, do we have to? I'm like, it's going to be fun, kids. Yeah. Then we can make a Victoria sponge with fresh strawberries. It's <laughs> like my mom says to me sometimes, she's like, you do realise that your kids sometimes just want to hang out at home. Yeah. Yeah. You're always taking them to some something world or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Like, My ridiculous. kids love being at home, but it's like they trash the place. <laughs> um, let's talk about pregnancy. You've openly admitted that you didn't like being yeah. pregnant. And again, that's not often said. It's really rubbish being pregnant, being short as well. <laughs> <That's> and <super. laughs> like my, my kid's dad's six foot two and I'm five foot four. These babies were so long and yeah. I think I was, and they're both girls. You know, you get pregnant everywhere with girls. Yeah. Were you like, sick? Not really. I just had like food aversions. Mm. Like I'd just eat one food for ages. See, I was sick every day for nine months. Vomiting. Vomiting. It was like to the, I was in bed to the point where I lift my finger up. I, I, could, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't even lift my finger up. And Pete used to think, Pete used to just, it was like... For all pregnancy. Yeah, especially the boys. I was literally dying. And Pete was like, you know, when I gave birth, it was like, I've seen the green mile where he breathes and all the badness comes <laughs> all out. All the bees. <laughs> Pete was like, that was me. He, he said I was horrible. I was, you know, I was mean. I was dramatic, emotional, ill. And the second the baby came out, it, 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 I was me again. And I was like, no, it was you. It was emotional, <laughs> unre unreasonable. But no, I just, yeah, no, my pregnancies are so bad. You feel like you're 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 an imposter in your own body, mm. or you've got an imposter in. I don't know. It's one of the two. And it's like you, you know, don't I, recognize yourself. No, it's and it's, hormonally. As I well. I like the look of it. I liked having big boobs. I like I loved my bum, but I was just so ill. My, my hair was falling out. I was covered in rashes. <laughs> It was it looked like a tin of beans all over my body. It was just awful. But I had such easy births. And I was like, you know, terrible pregnancy, easy birth. I had terrible pregnancy, terrible birth. I know. Do you want to go into that? <laughs> but you, ha you, you do feel guilty, don't you? You know, this miracle. I tried for over two years to get pregnant. So you feel like saying these things is terrible and you feel guilty about it. You do, but isn't... I think it's a weird idea that everything's that's black and white thinking. Like, just because you're, you know, you can make a big change in your life 
to be a better person, but you're still going to grieve the person you were before, even if the new version of you is better. It's always the same. It's not black and white. It's like, uh, just because I didn't enjoy pregnancy doesn't mean I don't enjoy the entirety of motherhood. Yeah. Like, it's not fair. It's another back to, like, being kinder to yourself one. Mm -hmm. Um, We have to forgive ourselves and also accept that, like, not everything's just, you know, one or the other. Mm. Like, we're nuanced. Mm. how was your birth then so my first one was terrible traumatic um you can read the full kind of detail in the book but it it was I had a premature rupture of membranes which meant that I was leaking my waters for a long time before I actually gave birth and they wanted to induce me at seven months because of the leak but I was I don't know why I was just adamant they wouldn't so I was drinking four litres of water a day to keep the baby in bed rest bed rest yeah and then in the end she was far in the end by the time I I think she was five weeks premature but I had infections and she was a high risk of infection and then it was 21 hours of labour and I did 14 hours with no pain relief because I was determined to do something naturally because I had it in my head that I'd like you know, I was born to do this. Yeah, but then... why, why would you think that? Like, I, you know, I don't know anyone who's had a straightforward birth apart from me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all my, 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 I, I didn't have a birth and plan because I thought, what is the point? Because you cannot predict how this baby's going to come out. I didn't read any of the baby books. I didn't want to know. Did I you just... go to the NCT classes? No. I didn't either. No. But I, I, I. I just didn't want to know anything. I just thought it's got to come out. So I booked... It'll happen somehow. It'll happen somehow. Um, I was induced with all four, booked in, had an epidural, no pain, no contraction pain at all, and then gave birth. And it was... My mum was like, I cannot believe that's how you've given birth. Amazing. And every single person I know, my my sister-in-law, my best friend... Both of my best friends have all nearly died giving birth. And even my doc, like I went privately. Fortunately, and my, my doctor's like, every woman should be offered this level of care because even though it's a natural thing, it's happened since the beginning of time. It's so traumatic. Yeah. And there should be more support. I think I um, experienced trauma from it for a long time and still do a bit because there was lots of things that I souvenirs that I had from the fact that it was so dramatic and then it was emergency cesarean and then I had an infection afterwards and I got mastitis three times and I couldn't stand up for three months afterwards um but then like even after that like everything was skewed um my hormones changed and all these things my body was just reacting to it as like it wasn't great um, but I'm really happy when I hear people like you say that they had a good birth because I feel like that this weird thing with women feeling like they failed if they have bad births or they resent other women for having good births or whatever, mm. it's just not great. And society's sort of geared towards everyone resenting each other. But I feel like the sisterhood's like, yeah the most important thing I do and I also know women as well who've had experiences like me terrible births and then cesarean and all that and then given birth vaginally in a really easy way the second time it's just that this the first time I had spine to spine I had Mm. a breach like all of it was just more not gonna happen Mm. proms whatever and then my second one was a planned cesarean because I was scared I didn't want to even attempt it again but I know people who have and have had successful vaginal births afterwards. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just went in and put full makeup on. I looked really nice in all the pictures. I had <laughs> lashes, everything. I was like... Yeah, in your, in your book, you talk about the postpartum psychosis, which I've never even heard of. Yeah. Well, there's an amazing writer called Laura Dockrill who's written loads of children's books, who's written a, a book about her postpartum psychosis, which went on for quite a prolonged amount of time and she ended up having to have proper like you know mental health care for it and everything luckily for me mine was temporary um I think that my psychotic episode lasted 
24 hours. So what but happened then, then? Postpartum depression came after, which is more spoken about. So what happened was because I had such a long labour and long birth and I was contractions for seven days um, and then obviously like 20... I, I think I slept three hours in seven days oh my God. because I had contractions the whole time and then I had 21 hours of labour. So when anyone sleeps so little, they get, you know, they lose their mind. Like I, I Oh, yeah, it's a form of torture. Yeah, so you, you do have... Sleep this, deprivation. But then because of going through that level of um, physical, you know, trauma as well, the baby was born and then day three is a thing mm. and that's commonly known and not spoken about enough. So day three, for all women that give birth will be a thing because it's notoriously the day that your milk comes in and you're, you have a huge hormonal shift that you start producing milk after the colostrum three days. Um, and then that can often link to like with an extreme hormonal shift, an extreme mental shift. Yeah. And because I'd not slept as well and I had that, it was a psychotic episode. So I was sort of hallucinating. Mm. So I believe that the doctors had sewn my head on somebody else's body. And it sounds funny, but in no, the moment, I genuinely traumatic. thought it was real. And I said to my partner, who was like asleep on the floor of the hospital, like I woke him up and it was four in the morning and I was like, you need to get me out of here because they've done this to me and they're trying to experiment on me. And I had real paranoia. And I looked down and it was like not my body and I was looking in my phone camera to see if it was my face and it was my face. So I was like, they've sewn the two wrong things together. Anyway, I pressed the emergency button because I knew the nurse that I trusted was on call and she came and I said, I think they've sewn my, I think the doctors have sewn my head on somebody else's body and, and did I, she recognize what you were going through straight away or was she like she looked at my chart and it's day three and she said she shouted to the other nurses we've got a day three <laughs> and I said I'd like to put my child up for adoption I'd spent so long trying to have this baby she was IVF and everything yeah. in the end and I'd it was so ridiculous that I'd wanted to go through all that and then have this baby put up for adoption she wasn't an accident she was wanted like so beyond the, all things um and she just she made me feel normal the way she handled it was so kind mm. and not dismissive she held my hand and she said this is normal day three is normal I'm gonna take the baby away I'm gonna take colostrum out of your boobs she took it all in syringes she was like you're gonna sleep for eight hours and then I'm going to bring her back and then I'm going to discuss with you whether you still want to put her up for adoption and whether you still feel like this and we'll take it from there. But let's just sleep now. And she just was like, don't think about anything else. So I said, thank you. And I went to sleep and then she brought her back in eight hours later and I was like, I am so sorry. Like, I don't want to like I, I want this baby and, I'll, you know, I want to learn to love her. But I started... At the beginning, I thought I'd look at her instantly and be like, this is my baby. I didn't. And I I didn't even recognise her as mine. How does that make mine. you feel? Like, f firstly, being open about that and your d daughter could read that one day. Hmm. Does that does that frighten you, how she'd feel reading that? And, and no, also... because I don't think it meant that I didn't love her or want to love her. It, it just meant that I was ill. Yeah. And, 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 and she definitely feels love. Yeah. You know, course. she's definitely wanted. And for you as a, a new mom to not feel that instant connection, obviously because of you were well at the time, do, how do you feel about that? I don't feel bad. I think that weirdly through my experiences, it made me open up to all sorts of things like the possibility of surrogacy, of adoption, mm. of all of that, because at the end of the day, what I felt was that my relationship with my child grew through time and bonding with that baby. And it didn't matter that she was my blood relative or not. I, I think I, I learned from doing that that I could love any child. Yeah. I started looking into adoption as well because of it. I was mm. like... I could love any baby. And yeah. before I was always like, I want my own baby. But 
no way. Now I I think you start from day one together. Yeah. Their day one's your day one. Yeah. I think there'll be a lot of women listening to this thinking, oh my God, I felt like that myself. And for you to be, you know, in your position, you know, in the public eye, to be mm. so brutally honest is really helpful and it's very brave. Thanks. <laughs> no, it is. Because, you know, going back to like my births, even to to say I had great births, I'm scared to even say that, you know, just in case you get, you know, like, oh. Well, that's know. not sensitive to other people. But the thing is, but you is can we only all... tell your story. Yeah, and the only... but the thing is, is that everyone is different and we, I, we respect, we should respect each other for, like, our different things. Some people, you know, love their baby instantly and then the baby becomes an adult and they can't stand that adult. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, some people, like, I mean, have the opposite. Like, you might go, oh, I'm not sure, and we had a rocky start and then from age 20 we just, like, were obsessed with each other. Yeah. Like, there's no one way to do there's anything. There's no right or wrong, yeah. And as long as you're, like self-aware enough and emotionally intelligent enough to accept that there's no one right way then you and your children will all be fantastic at parenting and being children yeah because you've just got to be open I think forgive yourselves and be and have an open dialogue about it even with your kids yeah. Like sometimes I say to mine, oh God, I thought you were so ugly when you were little. Yeah. And now look how gorgeous you are. <laughs> yeah. And they just like, they just laugh. I, I, because uh, it's normal, it's yeah. fine. But that, that's like me. When you look back at pictures of the babies, like I had the world's fattest <laughs> babies and I used to put them in like these little cute outfits and they looked horrendous when we look back <laughs> and me and Pete thought they were the gorgeous. best looking kid yeah. on earth. Completely bald, you know. Yeah. 25 stone <laughs> and um but that, that's all you see isn't it as a parent I, I think it's nice how you talk about your midwife wendy because i had yeah, the that's best who spoke to me after the strange ordeal i had the best midwife i had joan for the girls and pat for the boys and my god i couldn't have done that i couldn't have done it without them and it wasn't obviously because i had the pain relief it was more about i was so scared i am a total I am scared of everything I'm constantly thinking I'm gonna die <laughs> yeah you know my whole video of giving birth because I filmed them all it's like is it alive is it alive <laughs> you know and I couldn't have done it without them so yeah shout out to the midwives yeah <laughs> they're amazing I, I actually don't even know how being a mum of two a superstar pop star how do you even get time to write songs and write a book you know, well, I can't even read village, an email. It? <laughs> Literally, I am so busy. Like, how do you juggle it all? It takes village. I mean, I have, I have childcare. I have my mum. Um, people helping. Do yeah. it after bedtime. Yeah. Um, I can't keep my eyes open time. after half oh, eight. But also, sometimes it's like when I'm really struggling, I just have to remove myself and I say, I'm going to sit and write somewhere else. Mm. Like I'm going to work. Otherwise, I just won't do it. Because mm. the kids keep coming over to me while I'm typing. Yeah. Or if I... Oh, do you, you know, type your songs? Oh, no, typing, like, for writing books. But if I'm writing songs, I'll go to the studio anyway, so I'm not okay. at home. Okay, okay. So then sometimes they might be brought by, like, ch the nanny or, um, you know, their dad or whatever. I'm, I'm, you know, separated from their dad, but we have a good relationship. So, so how was that? Because I, I, obviously I read in the book that you did the co-parenting therapy. Is that what you call it? Separation therapy. Separation therapy, you know, and yeah. I, th I thought, God, what a great idea that is because usually people think we've split up, that's the end of that, they hate each other, it's a very hostile environment. But again, I think it's another brave thing that you've done to kind of make that relationship work well, for your kids. Well, both me and my ex were brought up in what they used to call broken homes, but I feel like some of them are broken even when the parents are together, so yeah. I don't like the term. But, like, um, we were both brought up with parents that didn't like each other or were at loggerheads all the time. Like, And we both bonded when we were together about the fact that it's difficult to feel pulled between parental arguments or animosity. And so... 
I decided that I wanted to find somebody to mediate so that yeah. we could like learn to remember and not forget why we really love each other in the first place and that we have great foundation for a relationship but our relationship ch would change shape rather yeah. than and just completely. end with bitterness yeah. and be awful and and it could have gone that way but I really fought hard to try uh, um, and do that and then he was thank god willing to I was like I don't want our kids to have what we had mm. and so now we like do stuff together as a family still like this year I went on holiday and he came for a few days on the holiday um and I always try and invite him and you know include him include him in stuff and if I'm really honest like with most things it does mostly come from me as we've discussed it's <laughs> always the mum mm. but um he's willing mm. and I think that we've done we've both worked really hard and done really well to um, have the relationship we've got. When did the breakdown start? Was that after you'd, the birth of your second child? I think before. Mm. But I really wanted another one. Yeah. But I, I also think, <laughs> though, as well, there's so many people who think having a baby will fix a relationship. I didn't. I, I, I remember, this is sad and it's in the book, but I remember this time when, because we did IVF, that I... It was locked down and the IVF clinic were like, just to let you know, we're still open. And I was like, what a great time. I'm not busy. Yeah. And I said to him, I'd like to have another one. And he said, I don't know if we'll make it. And I said, I don't care. It's quite rude to say, but I just really wanted another child. Mm. And it wasn't but for did myself. You mean that? Did you it, mean that, that you didn't care? Or were you just... It was that I thought it was worth doing even if, we didn't because yeah. I knew what it was like to be an only child growing up mm -hmm. and it was fine but as an adult it's difficult yeah because everything that she needs is gonna fall on me on you so you can't go to your sibling oh will you go to mum's at the weekend or whatever you're just like it's me it's, it's me it's me sisters it's a great like I've got a sister she's 12 years younger than me but you know there's things you tell your sister that you don't tell your mum yeah. And I think that relationship is so special. But I, I knew that I wanted that for my daughter. Yeah. And actually, I speak about in the book how the baby was always for her. And when she first saw that I was pregnant, she put her hand on my tummy. And it's in the book. She says, is that food or a baby? Oh. And I said, it's a baby and it's your baby. And she was like, thank you, mama. And then she cuddled me. And it's ever since, from day one, from the moment she came home, Loved that, daughter, that my oldest has felt that was her baby. That's gorgeous. My nine-year-old, when you ask her what she wants to be when she grows up, she's just like a mom. That's all she wants to be. Sweet. My eldest is like a supermodel, a tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> I want a white Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> so your album, Glorification of Sadness, that is written about your relationship breakdown mm. how was that writing that was it you know did it heal any pain did it cause any more trauma I feel like it really was healing to write it and it I wrote it chronologically so when you listen to the album from start to finish it's literally in order of how mm. the experience of grieving went for me and there's a song on it that's called Divorce, which has my children's voices in it. Ugh. And that it's one goosebumps. is really, really, really hard to sing. And so it was it was like a process that was quite therapeutic, but then performing it live and like it felt like bringing stuff up again, yeah. like opening cans of worms. And I didn't think that I could sing that song, Divorce, live on tour. And I did 57 shows. <gasps> I think that I'd, I think that I sung it like at least 40 of those shows and over time it did become healing but at first it was really difficult yeah and it's also the bit that gets me is it starts with my kids playing in the garden I can hear them and I remember the scene and I remember the way the light was and everything and so it sort of makes me well up to know yeah. that I'm about to sing about the fact that I broke up with their dad and it's hard to like even think about but I feel like that in conjunction with the book has mm. been 
something that a lot of people have um it's resonated with yeah people. it definitely has you know but yeah it's so interesting how getting your feelings on paper yeah can really it's help. weird as well because sometimes you feel am i saying too much like it's very but i think um, that's why it does resonate because it's honest yeah. you know I, I think it's just difficult i think m must be people out there and that like thinking i'll never date her because you don't want it all written down <laughs> yeah. but like i can't help but right i think i think quite often with art i think that it's much more common for women to, to speak about their own experiences and than men quite often fictionalise things, like they invent characters, like yeah. male writers write whole fiction. A lot of women, when you interview writers, female writers, like loads of what they write about it's comes experience. from experience, yeah. even if it's fiction. Mm. Okay, so at the start of your book, you say, this book is for my daughters and yours. Mm. Looking at our daughters, we both have them. How can we create a healthy, strong future for them, do you think? Wow. I, I feel quite, if I'm really honest right now, I feel quite sad about the world, like mm. looking at all the injustice. And I'm very, I'm much more political than I used to be. I don't know why in my 20s I was just like all about self, but now I feel so hyper aware about current affairs and yeah, devastated too. at the world that we live in when there's so much injustice, Um, you know, and I'm sort of a bit obsessive about it, actually. Mm. But um, so I think that, and it's probably never going to happen, and people go, "Ha, oh, she's so naive and ideological. But I wonder whether if, if therapy was mandatory across the board globally, that there would be less wars, particularly for men, because I think as women, we therapise each other quite often. We talk about our feelings, but yes. I just wonder whether these men in power that are like actually ruling the world, making insane decisions about obliterating whole races of people, being violent, bombing, whatever. I, th I wonder if they'd had adequate therapy, whether they'd jump to those conclusions of that's a great way to solve problems. So yeah, thank you. Again, Paloma, for Thank coming you. on. I love the book. But before you go, I want to know what is the next chapter for you? Um, I feel that I'm in a phase that a lot of women feel when they've turned 40, where, like, the world that I inhabited doesn't necessarily feel as welcome as it used to. And I'm not going to sort of, like, try and pretend that I'm 25 anymore because that's just rubbish and mm. an unfair... Um, expectation on women so my next chapter is probably about redefining I think yeah. and exploring new things and being creative I'll always make music I will be writing new music but I want to open my mind up and my world up to like you know maybe I'm yet to have my biggest success mm, that's positive yeah well that's how I feel like I'm 40 next year and I'm like this is why I did this podcast because I just want to be you know, there's so many incredible people out there with amazing stories yeah. and I just I just want to feel inspired. I feel like, you know, even at this age, I can learn so but much it's not more. old, that's the problem. No, I know. My mum said she felt the best when she was 40. She yeah. was like in her best era. So, yeah, yeah. bring it on. 